Laptop computer spins onto the screen, opens, and displays ATP Education Program webinar series, closes, and then spins off the screen. Welcome to the third session in our series on adoption versus abandonment and the power that we have over influencing these factors with assistive technology. This section, number three, will focus on adoption and how we can help students with using the technology that we have matched and hopefully found productive for them. Hello, I'm Sarah Bass. I am a speech pathologist and an assistive technology professional, and I will be leading you through this third part as well. So adoption, as we defined in that first section or the introduction, is a student using the device. They're using it, they become independent with it, and even they might be able to develop some skills in terms of self-determination and self-advocacy in regards to their device. So adoption can go much further than just picking it up and taking it out of the bag and using it. The objectives that I'd like for us to get to in this 15 minutes is first to outline the four stages of the adoption cycle. And then secondly, identify key players who can influence the adoption of technology. So we know that when new technology comes out, we tend to have the early adopters uh, and then the later adopters. I myself am a little bit of a later adopter. I've been burned a few times by getting something when it just comes out. As we saw in that last section on abandonment, you might buy the newest tool that comes from Sweden, and even though they have a great repair policy and everything, getting that tool to Sweden and back isn't going to be the easiest thing. It could be that there are bugs or fixes that are just not worked out yet. So some people are the first on the bandwagon when something comes out. Some come in a little bit later. Uh, regardless of where somebody falls on this curve, there is the idea that you have to adopt the new technology which means being able to learn it, maybe unlearn it, relearn it, and adjust to whatever changes that might happen. When we talk about adoption, we need to understand that there are phases that everything goes through. So we start by taking a look at Kinch and DePaula from 2002, where they talk about these four phases. The selection phase, which is like our assistive technology consideration. The learning phase, where we get everybody involved so they can understand the tool integration, getting it into the environment, and then developing, getting more use out of a tool, finding no more novel ways to use it. As you can see on the right, if we don't match something correctly in that first selection phase, uh, we're probably going to have that device end up on the shelf. If we're seeing that the student doesn't need it to exist, we might not see that integration phase taking place. A student might not see the value in something, so why learn it? So we're not going to get past any of those first few phases if we don't have a tool that is matched to the student and their environment. I really like this graphic here because it does kind of give some other definitions or some indicators as to what each phase should allow us to do. In the selection phase, for example, it shows a nice trial reassessing, did something work for us? These are very familiar to the quiet indicators that we discussed in section one. Unfortunately, if we think about considering assistive technology just at the AT meeting or just before the AT meeting, we often don't get time to put that trial into place. And so we jump straight to the learning phase, which could fail because we've not made the best match. And then the integration phase and the development phase are also not going to occur. So by looking at these four phases, I typically like to start with that selection phase unless we have a student who's been using something for a while. It really goes right in line. And if you can identify at what stage it's breaking down, that can help you understand why something is not being adopted or why it is. The other part of this study identified that these are the key players when it comes to adopting technology. Of course, we have the user. That's the person who's going to be in charge of pushing all the buttons and actually engaging and accessing their environment. The caregiver and their perceptions, the AT specialist, and developers. I broke this down to fit a little bit more into a school versus a clinical situation by thinking more about it as the family, the student, and the teacher. And I'm lumping myself as an AT person in with the teacher. I'm going to put the family in a little bit more with caregivers. 
we can see with successful adoption, the user has to want change. They have to have some type of frustration tolerance. If you have a student who, um, let's say, picks up a new iPad game and doesn't click around or figure out how to play it and just says, this is dumb, I'm not going to use it, you probably have that student who's not going to be able to troubleshoot their assistive technology. So you might want to rule some things out in consideration because it might be more complex than the student is willing to deal with. Uh, you want the student to have pride in the device that they're using. This is where getting something that's not bulky or old or, you know, not the right color sometimes can even influence whether a student wants to use something or not. And the student has to be able to integrate it into their routine. Now, the student is the one we typically look at when we're talking about adopting technology. But it's really important to have these other team members on board as well, because who's going to teach the student how to use it? We know from looking at the quiet indicators that having only one person on the team is not going to cut it. We need the caregivers and the teachers to understand how to use that technology. Even if it's, okay, I can jump in and help you troubleshoot, even if I don't know every single aspect of this. Uh, you have to be willing to support the user in a way that the user is comfortable. There's nothing like seeing a student who just kind of shuts down because someone comes over and addresses them in the middle of class and every other student has to turn around and see what's going on. So as teachers or caregivers or parents, we need to be conscientious of that as well. Uh, I like this under specialists where it talks about have a collaborative rather than a directive approach. I know in the previous section I talked about how I'll let the student tell me if they think something sucks because that way they'll open up and they'll tell me what is the issue there. What is the real problem that they're having? I mean, things don't just inherently suck. There's usually a reason for it. Sometimes it's, okay, I don't know how to use something and I need some more training. Sometimes it's, I don't like the color. I don't like the look of it. Sometimes it might be that we've stumbled across something that might be cultural that we might not have been aware of before. Uh, and at the same time, with caregivers, we need to have our perceptions aligned not just with the school staff, but also with the caregiver, that it's okay to be using the assistive technology. Uh, this is where cultural factors can really play an invisible role that you might not always see at the front end. If we say to a student, oh, that looks big or that looks ugly, it might internalize to the student as well. So even if the user is really excited, if a teacher doesn't like the program, it's going to show. Uh, I didn't talk a lot about the developer over here because that's typically something that goes beyond what we see within the school, but I have found that if you call someone who manufactures a tool and ask to troubleshoot with them, or you call a manufacturer or a distributor of a tool and ask for training, they can give you help. They can direct you to YouTube videos. They might have reps that can help you out. All of these things can go towards adoption of that tool. How we teach the tool is going to make a huge difference in how it's adopted. Uh, I like the idea of hierarchies where you have small steps. So uh, with a student that I had referenced earlier in the presentation where she didn't like using the text to speech because she didn't like the voices, one of the first things we did was we had her kind of American Idol style critique each of the voices that we had available to us. and. She got kind of hilarious. She got a little, you know, out of uh, the professional realm of, I'd say, being a high school sophomore. But she was able then to choose the one that she identified as sucking the least. And then we were able to use that voice to try and lead her in by saying, okay, we're going to give you control over one thing so we can get to the next. It was a really good way to um, lead her in. You also can look at task analysis. What part is going to be easy for the student and what's going to take a little bit more teaching? Uh, every special ed teacher knows how to tell you how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich to the point where <laughs> you never want to see another point peanut butter and jelly sandwich again. But if we can figure out what specific things will be more difficult, we can focus on those with the student and provide them with more support. And then finally, the involved parties. Again, it cannot be one person. It cannot just be the IT person or the AT person or just the student. 
Other people in the environment need to understand why the tool is being used and how to use it. So we don't start at the top. We have to think about how big the steps can be. This is where I like to sometimes, when we're writing an IEP, put in additional accommodations or modifications, even though we have just added an assistive technology tool, which should, in theory, decrease the number of accommodations and modifications. And the reason I think of it this way is there is a learning curve for any new technology. And if we take a student and say, okay, you've been doing it this way and you've been getting Bs, and now I give you assistive technology and all of a sudden you're getting Cs, that's going to reflect to the student. So sometimes there will be conversations with the teachers of, can we reduce the workload? Because it's going to be difficult for the student to learn how to edit their work now that they're using speech to text. Can we maybe decide that when we're grading, we're not going to pay attention to a certain type of errors for one quarter? just so the student can learn editing in a little bit of a free environment where they're not going to lose points just because they're learning how to use a new technology. So it's something to definitely consider as we go forward. Another tool, and this is a project that I have been working on and it's continued to evolve through the Great Lakes ADA, is the Quality Indicators of Assistive Technology Post-Secondary. It focuses on the transition of students from that K through 12 world into post-secondary and adult life. Because, I mean, what's the goal of school? If we're going to put kids in a classroom from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade or through transition age, what, what are we doing with all that time if not preparing them to live the rest of their lives? Um, the quality indicators post-secondary we're continually adding resources. It's a free assessment. It counts as an indicator 13 assessment. If you have not worked with transition, go find a case manager who does, and they will be very happy that it counts as an <laughs> indicator 13 um, activity or assessment. And know that this also gives information on what we can do to influence a student continuing to use their assistive technology beyond our K through 12 environment. Sometimes that can promote adoption of a technology when a student understands how it will impact their whole life. Um, this is something I really love to kind of show off. Um, Dr. Ben Satterfield out of Georgia Tools for Life did this great study and sometimes it's hard to get the numbers to prove things, but I love that he looked at students with high incidence disabilities. Those who had mastered AT in high school when they went to college their GPA either went up or had no change in 88% of students. That's almost 90%. That's pretty cool. And we saw the GPA go down with about 12%, which, you know, college does that to people. But for students who had not mastered their assistive technology, only 33% went up or saw no change, and 67% went down. Now, from working with the post-secondary project, I can tell you Students do not typically identify as having disabilities, especially when they have a high incidence disability, because they're serviced by accommodations and modifications that just are not available at the collegiate level. So we need to teach them how to use assistive technology and give them the confidence to use it before they leave our hallways and doors and desks, because if they are successful adopters, it's more likely that they will be successful throughout life and not just in our classroom situations. So now that we've talked about some factors to help us with adoption, here's my little bonus activity for you. Uh, looking at those four phases that were identified for adoption, which one do you feel applies the most to your role on a student's team? Because I know as the assistive technology person, kind of where I usually am called in and where I usually take the lead, but how about for you? Um, what do you do for your students? What has worked for you? What has been a struggle? So these are the four parts, selection, learning, integration, and development, and hopefully you can identify some things or some factors that you might be able to influence to increase adoption of technology. This ends section three on adoption of technology. We will continue on with consideration in the next section. Thank you for watching. For more information on the ATP Education Program, please visit our website at 
atp.nebraska.gov forward slash education or email us at atp.education at nebraska.gov.